Shall we stand all over the house tonight? And let's usher in the Lord's Sabbath with a hand clap of praise to this evening. Oh, we worship you, God. We praise you, God. We glorify you, God. We lift up your name, Father. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your love and your power. There's nobody like you, Father. Oh, bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name. Move in this service tonight in a special way. Bless this service. Bless this service. Anoint this place with your power and your glory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Shabbat Shalom and welcome to the Revival Center on this, the Sabbath. Amen. Come on, are you ready to enter into his rest? Amen. Come on, not just, a, not just a spiritual rest, but a physical rest. the hills are his strength I don't know where you are tonight I don't know if you're going through a battle where you feel you're at your lowest but praise God his hand is there with you hallelujah I don't know if you're in the ocean right now and waves are crashing down and you feel like you're sinking but his hand is there Hallelujah. And that gives us reason to praise him and worship him. I've come with worship on my lips, a psalm in my heart, and a sacrifice to bring out the altar. And I hope you've done the same. Let's break out of the box. Let's break the mold and let us worship like God created us to worship in his glory. Amen. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Uh, there are those among us that, outside of our church that say, well, there's no need for a physical Sabbath anymore. Well, we used to believe that. That there's no need for the physical observance of the commandment. But the problem with that mentality is, is if it's all been spiritualized away, then thou shalt not kill no longer has a physical meaning either. And thou shalt not still ha no longer has a physical, actual meaning either. Come on now. Thou shalt not commit adultery then, I guess if that's true, no longer has a physical meaning either. But we know that it does. And He is our spiritual rest, but the physical rest, the, the Sabbath, the Shabbat, He gave us since creation, before the law was ever given. Amen. And I'm glad to be a part of that here tonight and to honor that and to keep His commandments as the covenant people of God. Let's start this service off right with a hand clap of praise unto Him tonight. Praise and worship ought to come from our lips and our heart tonight. We ought to give God our best. We ought to give Him our best tonight. Praise God. 
Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Hallelujah to our God. Glory, hallelujah to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. God, my Savior. is to our God every word of worship in one accord every praise every praise is to our God every praise is to our God oh every word of worship in one accord every praise every praise to our God, God my, God my Savior, God my healer, God my deliverer, yes He is, yes He is, God my Savior. God my healer, God my deliverer, yes he is, yes he is. Give God a praise offering tonight in the house of the Lord. He's worthy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh glory. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God. We're going to rebuke the devil out of thy sound man tonight. Uh, no, I mean out of the sound system. Hallelujah. I saw... Hallelujah. I'm just kidding tonight. No, I appreciate all that the sound guys do. They've been working hard to get it to working better. It's a progress. It's a progress. It's a process. A lot of things have happened in the last 24 hours that affected a lot of people. But uh, I hope tonight that this service will affect us in a special way tonight that we'll never be the same. That every person here tonight will never, ever be the same. That our lives will be changed and conformed into His image. Jesus, most beautiful name of all names. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, Jesus, Jesus, the only name that brings healing. When I speak your name. When I speak your name, mountains move, chains are loose. When I speak your name, when I speak your name, darkness flees, it has no hold on me. Jesus, the most beautiful name that I know, you're the exalted one, Jesus, you have the power alone, you lift the lowly one, oh, Jesus.
oh yes, most wonderful name above all names, oh yeah. the only name that brings freedom from your chains and your bondage when i speak your name mountains move chains are loose when i speak your name when i speak your name darkness flees it has no hope I want to tell somebody, I don't know, maybe the world is treating you bad right now. Maybe bad things are happening in your life. Maybe somebody's treating you wrong. Maybe somebody's breaking your heart. But recognize the whole world isn't doing it to you. And God sure isn't doing it to you. So don't take it out on the whole world. Don't take it out on God. He's only going to do good things in your life. If you've ever been hurt by another human being, that ought not be the reason that you blame God. That ought to be the determination that you don't want to be a sinner. Sinners hurt people. People who don't have God first in their life will put you last. Oh, I just said a mouthful. People that don't have God first in their life will put you last. So don't let what's happened to you affect your outlook on everybody and everything. And don't let their messed up life mess yours up. Don't let their bad decision make your bad decisions. Come on, somebody rise up tonight and say, I'm going to be victorious. I'm not going to be defeated in my thoughts. I'm not going to be defeated in my mind. I'm not going to let the devil cause me to blame God for what's going wrong in my life. I'm going to place the blame where it's due. God hasn't hurt me. Only sinners at the hands of sinful men and the work of Satan. See, if the devil can get you to blame God, then you're listening to the wrong voice. Be exalted. Be exalted. Be exalted. Higher and higher. Be exalted. Be exalted. Be exalted. Come on, sing that right now. Be exalted. Be exalted. Sing it to him. Be exalted. Higher and higher. Be exalted. We worship you, Lord. We glorify you. We exalt you. We magnify you, God. No other name, no other name, I know, 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 speak that name. Come on, there's power when you speak that name, no other name. No other name, I know. No other name, no other name, I know. No other name, no other name, I know. 
speak that name and watch what happens. There was a name. There was a name. I know. There was a name. There was a name. I know. There was a name. There was a name. I know. Come on, give God a mighty hand clap of praise. Come on, let's worship him. Worship him right now. From the front to the back. Worship him. Oh, yes. Come on, don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Give God a high praise. Give God a Sabbath praise. Hallelujah. Woo. Praise God. It's good to see each one of you here tonight. It's good to see Sierra back with us. Amen. And all of our guests, if you're a guest, we are glad that you're with us for our Sabbath service. We hope you join us every service on Sunday morning at 1030 every week. Our Sabbath service is our important service. Our Sunday morning service is our biggest service. That's when the majority of the congregation is here on Sunday. But the covenant people of God come on Friday night too. The covenant people of God. The Pentecostal people will just come on Sunday, but the Tabernacles congregation will come on Friday. Come on, it's a process. They're coming out. We got to grow with them. We got to be patient with them. Hallelujah. Come on, God is doing special things among us right now. I don't know if you were here this past Sunday or not, But uh, we had an incredible, incredible altar call. Many people had already left. Sister Pebbly, if you can bring up the picture from our altar call Sunday. Not that one. It was the one that, uh, that's one of them when we were praying for the kids. We anointed all of the children here in the altar from our children's ministry and our Sunday school. This is in our Sunday service. Isn't that awesome? All those kids up there praying. That touches my heart. That touches my heart. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for what God is doing. I believe there's another picture that uh, of the powerful altar call that we had Sunday. It really was a telltale story of what God did. I really believe special things happened in that service. It really, I, I've had text messages this week of people that have told me they've seen a change in their children because we anointed our children with this special oil Brother Tucker made that is specifically for the anointing of children. I'm telling you folks, I believe God wants to do a revival among our kids. I said I believe God wants to do a revival among our kids. I want you to... When we go into worship, I want you to notice these children right up here. And I want you to think about the future of this church and the future of the kingdom of God. I want you to think about the greatness of what God is doing in the ark. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's all raise our hands all across this place right now and thank God for His goodness and His mercy. Love on Him right now. Love on Him. Love on Him. Father, we exalt you. Can you all see that picture? That was the altar call Sunday. (laughs) Isn't God awesome? To see the altar full, it's kind of dark. But to see the altar of God full like that, there's something special about that. To see those kids up there praying. I have prayed over this picture multiple times this week. How many wants to see a revival among our children? (laughs) 
Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. A house of prayer. Sing out. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. God, touch our children. Sing that again now, Lord. Make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. A house of prayer. Lord, make me a house. Sing it as a prayer. Make me a house of prayer. Of prayer. May the fire of my altar never burn out. Fire of my altar never burn out. Fire of my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. May the fire of my altar never burn out. Fire of my altar never burn out. Fire of my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. Lord, make me a house, make me a house of prayer, a house of prayer. Well, Lord, make me a house, make me a house of prayer, a house of prayer. Well, may the fire of my own turn never burn out fire of my altar never burn out fire of my altar never burn out make me a house of prayer may the fire of my altar never burn out fire of my altar never burn out fire of my altar never burn out day and night and night and day Day and night and night and day, day and night and night and day, make me a house of prayer. Day and night and night and day, day and night and night and day, day and night and night and day, make me a house of prayer. Oh, day and night and night and day, oh, yeah. Day and night and night and day, make me a house of prayer. Give him praise one more time. Give God a high praise. A high praise tonight. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. We want to go before the Lord in prayer tonight. There are several needs we want to take before God. Yeah, I'm sad tonight to uh, announce that uh, Sister Tanya Muzio's husband, John Muzio, passed away last night. Um, yesterday evening, late last evening, that's Brother Emmanuel McClay and Brother Joshua King's stepdad. And... Um, they, they are saying natural causes, but uh, anyways, we need to pray for Sister Tanya tonight and the whole family and everybody that is involved or affected by this. We'll give you more information as time goes on about the services and the arrangements and all of that, but uh, please pray for our precious sister and the loss of her husband. Amen. Remember that. Remember that. And if you see somebody that's not here that normally is, pray for them. And pray for our service tonight. Pray for our service Sunday. Believe with big and high expectations for God to do great things as we enter the fall feast season. Special things to happen this time of the year. How many has a need tonight by the raising of the hand that you would submit to God? 
just wave it. He knows it right now. Just whisper it to him. Everybody, tell him your prayer request right now. Just as you wave your hand, let him know privately. Just right now, we can all tell our prayer requests at the same time. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You know our needs tonight. You know our needs tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's go before the Lord in prayer right now. Let's lift our voice to him. Amen. And let's touch the throne of God tonight in the name of Jesus. Father, we call upon you. Heavenly Father, you're an awesome God. Almighty Yahovah, we call upon you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. The name of Jesus, our Messiah, our Christ. And we ask you, Lord, to bless this service. Bless this service. Bless every need. Be with Sister Tanya. And be with Brother John's family, John Muzio's family, his son, his brother and sister, his family members. I pray that you'll comfort them and strengthen them and help them. I pray for the King family, the McClay family, everybody that is affected. God, I ask in Jesus' name you to minister to each one of these needs. Touch Sister Nancy Major tonight who needs a complete healing in her body. Father, work a miracle in her body. Bring healing to her and wholeness and help to her. Touch Sister Holly McKinney tonight in Jesus' name. God, we present these needs to you in faith. We believe that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. In Jesus' name we pray by faith. Everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated tonight. Return back to your seats. Praise God. What a beautiful atmosphere that's here tonight. And I'm thankful for that. Thankful for each one of you that are here this evening. And um, what an awesome God we serve. What an awesome God we serve. We ask the ushers to come and receive our Friday night tithing and offering. Please make sure you're tithing your 10%, which is a command, right? First fruits. It's not just 10%, it's the first 10% belongs to the house of God. It belongs to the, the church that you're eating from, the table that you're eating from. So uh, make sure your tithing goes in an envelope tonight and address it accordingly. Uh, I understand why some folks don't want to put their name on their envelope or whatever, but the thing is, is my goodness, why wouldn't you want to take credit for obeying God? <laughs> I mean, I, I, it just makes sense to me that you'd want to take credit for obeying God. Uh, so, that's right. Amen. You want your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, so, amen. I think it's just important that we do things the right way. Ushers, go ahead and receive this offering, be it blessed in Jesus' name, and give liberally unto the Lord as God has blessed you. Praise God. In the way of announcements, don't forget our Sunday morning worship service as we will receive of the Lord's Supper as well. And, uh, and we will, uh, and we're going to have an awesome time in the Lord. And don't forget, as we bring up all the rest of the announcements, uh, Youth Cookout, August 26th from 2 to 4 at the Myers House. Youth Choir, practice every Sunday after service. See Sister Myers for details. 2016 business meeting, August 27th at 9.30. That's before our Sunday service, an hour early, and we'll go over the business from last year. I want to announce that. As by law, we're supposed to three times. September 10th is the day I've asked you to clear your schedule for a Sunday morning and Sunday evening service, right? Amen. Amen. This is for the whole church. Sunday morning at 10.30, Sunday evening at 6.30. Brother Larry Smith from El Campo, Texas, will be ministering for us, one of the most powerful speakers I've ever brought in, I truly believe, and, uh, and he will bless us greatly. So make sure you clear your schedule for Sunday, September the 10th, Sunday morning and Sunday evening. Amen. All right, prison ministry, we need volunteers. We'll see Sister Pebley on Sunday to get a packet and return to Sister Willis with your ID. All right, sign team practice, August 24th at 
Bible study and fellowship with Brother Dan Winters every Tuesday at 645 here at the church. I, I, I would encourage all of our new converts to come to this to get you established, to get you stabilized and rooted and grounded and solid in the faith. So if you're new to the church or you're a new convert or a new member, I encourage you to come and learn. It would be good for you. Amen. Women of Strength, this is this, the session every week we have just for the ladies. Uh, Sister Baker leads it from 1230 to 230, and it's met here at the Ark. Um, and so that's this coming Wednesday. Uh, at 1230, so keep that in mind, and also rejected to accepted, this is our addiction-free class where we focus on the emotional healing uh, and mental healing and breaking free from addictions and bad habits, August 27th from 630 on, and August 28th from 6 p.m. on, Sister Jamie Blanton will be here Sunday, you can see her for details on that, and I believe, yes, prayer meeting every Friday. At 12, I was unable to make it today, but let's remember that. I know several of you have been coming, and I thank you for that. Keep it up. Keep it up. Rome wasn't built in a day, and a praying church takes faithful people that will stick with it. So uh, every, uh, every Friday at noon here at the church, and that kind of is a prayer session that prepares us for the weekend services. And I think that's a very good place to be. Amen. Praise God. Everybody's dismissed from the platform tonight. Hallelujah. We love and appreciate everybody that serves in, in, on the platform ministry, singers and praise singers and musicians, hard workers. I was teasing earlier about the sound men. Thank you, Brother Corn, Brother uh, Chris, and uh, Brother Randy for all that you do. And Brother and Sister Pebbly helped back there as well, and it's not always easy. And I know Brother Fred helps with the camera, Brother McClay and different ones, and I'm just thankful for people that are faithful to help and to uh, support the, uh, the ministry of the ark. Amen? Amen? Praise God. All right, so tonight I believe the preschoolers and the kindergartners are going to be dismissed, but everybody else is staying in here tonight. That's per Sister... Um, Harrison all right so preschoolers and kindergartners oh, that's the nursery the nurseries is the nursery open yes the nursery's open as well the nursery's of course open and preschoolers that's so basically that's zero to six probably there are zero to six somewhere around that age group and don't forget uh, Sundays our youth class for our teenagers and uh, we're striving to see great things happen in our church how many is ready to hear from God tonight I have a word from the Lord that God is going to I really believe God has something to say to us tonight a fresh word from heaven and uh, so open your ears and your heart to receive from God tonight praise God it's good to see everyone here this evening, and uh, folks that haven't been here for a week or two, I'm glad the school year's starting back, everybody's back in town now, and uh, you could feel it this past Sunday in the, in the crowd, it was just, uh, I felt like more folks were back, school year's beginning, so uh, good to see everyone back tonight, amen. If you would, uh, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 42. Amen. Isaiah 42, as you stand for the reading of God's Word, Isaiah 42 and 9. Praise God. Isaiah 42 and 9. Let's pray for Sister Joyce Oak's sister, uh, I think, who was rushed to the hospital earlier uh, with some, some illness, so pray for her. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 9. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things. Oh, my religious folks don't like these verses. New things do I declare. Oh, there's nothing new under the sun. Well, tell God that. New things 
do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Isaiah 43 and 18. Isaiah 43 and 18. Remember ye not the former things. That's the things of the past. Remember ye not the former things. Neither consider the things of old. I think, frankly, some of us do way too much. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you know it. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And then the words of Jesus confirm it in Matthew 9. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 17. Very powerful scripture, not really ever preached or taught from very much. And you'll probably understand why after we're done. Matthew 9, 17, Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Out with the old, in with the the new. Sure, there are things in the world, the culture of the world, the way the world does things that are new. They're not really new. It's really a revival of a bunch of old things that haven't ever worked before, i.e. socialism, communism, uh, so on and so forth. They may be new to America, uh, but that doesn't make them right. But there are some things that God wants to do in this hour that there is no point of reference to point back to. To say, He's done it this way before. He's done this before. Remember not the former things of old. For I will do a new thing in the earth, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. So tonight the title of my message is New Wine and New Wineskins. New wine and new wine skins. You can be seated tonight in Jesus' name. The text from these verses that speaks to us of God being the God of the new. He's all about making all things new. New wine. New wine represents a new move of the Holy Ghost. Somebody's alarm clock's going off. Hallelujah. It's time for the preaching. Glory to God. <laughs> I'm just playing. New wine represents a new move of the Holy Ghost. It represents new signs and new wonders, a new day, a new horizon. A new start. A new beginning. Wine in Scripture is always symbolically represents the Spirit of God. It, it represents the liberty of the Spirit of God and the intoxicating power of the Spirit of God. I'm reminded when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. I'm reminded of the words of Peter when he explained to the onlookers what was happening. As 120 were filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with new tongues. His words to them was, in describing this event, he said, These men are not drunk as ye suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day or, the, or 9 a.m. in Jewish time. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel that in the last days saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. He did not say they weren't drunk. He just said they were not drunk as ye suppose. 
So this was a spiritual drunkenness that took place to them and an intoxicating effect of the Holy Spirit. And friend, I want you to know that that is a drunk that I want to stay on. problem that many people have as Christians is they've been sober too long. Some of us have sobered up spiritually. Just because you sobered up in the natural doesn't mean you got to sober up in the Holy Ghost. Some of us need to stay saturated and intoxicated with the power of the new wine of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I just want to make some points and I want to establish some facts tonight and I hope that this will clear up some things for you. The problem is not that God does not want to give us new wine. Remember what I said new wine is, a new move of the Holy Ghost, new signs and wonders, a new day, a new beginning, a new start, a new beginning, a new dawn, a new horizon. It's not that God doesn't want to give us new wine. Are you ready? It's that we're not ready for it. Until the skins change, the wine, the new wine can't be poured out. Until the skins can be stretched, until the skins can become elastic, until the skins can learn to be flexible and moldable, they cannot contain or receive what God is wanting to pour out in this hour. It's not that God is not willing to give us new wine. The problem is, is that much of churchianity is not willing to allow that same God that wants to give us new wine to also allow Him to stretch our old wine skins. God says in His Word, through the man Jesus Christ, God in flesh, God cannot and will not pour new wine into old wine skins. Do you understand? You are the wine skin. You are the container of the Spirit of God. You are the housing agent. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the wine skin. Your attitude, your thinking, your paradigm, your worldview is the wine skin. And old wine skins, you see, are hard, <laughs> but they're also brittle. They break easily. God, I hope I'm not describing you spiritually or emotionally. Old wineskins are brittle and they break easy. They become hard but yet brittle at the same time. They will not stretch. They will not expand. And so God gives the wineskin an option. Either bend or break. One of the two. One or the other. You have to either bend or break. You have to expand and stretch to receive what God is wanting to pour into you. You see, when the wineskin can expand and stretch, then it is ready. Somebody say ready for new wine. And a bottle of wine. Did you know that a bottle of wine expands? Wine expands. It ferments. It expands. It enlarges. A new wineskin has the ability to expand with the wine. Hallelujah. A new wineskin has the ability to stretch and to expand with the expanding wine. But if you put new wine in old wineskin, 
then the wineskin cannot expand with the new wine, so it will either break or it will bend. Now, I want to talk tonight, when we speak about new wine, do you understand what we're talking about? We're talking about expansion. Expansion, church growth. We're talking about an expansion of attitudes and ideas and expanding, allowing God to expand our mind. God wants to do a new thing in our life, but we box Him in with old wineskins. God wants to do a new thing in your life. He wants to expand you in every area. I want to tell somebody here tonight, this is a prophetic word. God wants to expand some things in your business, in, in your ministry, in your marriage, in your personal life, in your family. He wants to make it larger. He wants to expand it. He wants to give it a new vitality. He wants to give it a new unction. He wants to give it a new intoxicating element because it's become stale. And the new wine has to have new wineskins or else the wineskin cannot receive the wine that needs and has to be poured into it. And I'm going to tell some of you right now, that until you're willing to expand yourself, you will not be able to receive the size of the expansion that God wants to pour into you and bless your marriage, bring increase to your life, increase to your business, increase to your family, increase to your finances, increase to your ministry, increase to this church until you are willing to expand with the wine that's expanding, then you are not ready to receive what God has for you. Hallelujah. My goodness. So we are asking God tonight to show us and point out to us any old wineskins in us that could hinder God from expanding and from giving us increase personally and corporately and bringing growth to us personally growth to our marriages and our ministries and to our church abroad. And that growth will come when we receive that new wine. But until we ready ourselves and prepare our thinking and prepare us individually, we will not receive it no matter how much God wants to give it to us. Hallelujah. Let me give you the context of this in Matthew chapter uh, 9 when Jesus speaks to the Israelites about uh, giving new wine, but the old wineskins weren't ready to receive it. Let me give you the, the scenario surrounding this, the context. Jesus is speaking to old covenant Israelites. Do you understand that he wasn't dead yet, so the new covenant had not begun? Jesus was a law-keeping Jew. Amen. It wasn't, the, the New Testament did not begin. In Matthew chapter 1, I know that in the Bibles, in our Bibles, it shows it that way. But you have to understand, it did not begin until he said, it is finished at Calvary. That's when the new covenant truly began. And so Jesus was speaking to old covenant Israel, who had an old temple worship system with old animal sacrifices, with an old Levitical priesthood, with an old circumcision. And so he's trying to prepare them to get rid of the old temple worship system, to get rid of that old priesthood of the Levites and replace it with the Melchizedek priesthood, to replace the physical circumcision with a spiritual one. Are you following me right now? To replace an old temple with a spiritual temple. That's us, the church. The problem was when he's speaking this to them, you have to understand, Jesus was talking about the new covenant. He was saying, I want to pour out the Holy Ghost. I want to pour out the new covenant into Israel. But the problem was, he came into his own, and his own received them not. And so in this scripture,
Scripture, Jesus was actually telling them He could not pour this New Covenant wine of the New Covenant into an old system. So what did Jesus have to do? He had to die at Calvary. He had to tear down the veil. And 40 years later, at 70 AD, Titus had to come in, destroy the temple system, destroy the Levitical priesthood, dis- dis- disperse the Israelites, one million Jews killed, 900,000 led captive. He had to destroy old Judaism. You understand? When we talk about the law of God, that is not Judaism. We are not studying Judaism. Judaism is corrupt. Judaism is not what we're looking for. Jesus destroyed that. The law of God is important to us. But Judaism mixed the law of God with a bunch of man-made traditions that we want nothing to do with. Now, this is so important to understand. When Israel would not receive this new covenant wine because they were an old religious wineskin, when they could not receive it, He had to scatter them, destroy their temple, and to this day, nearly 2,000 years later, there has never been another temple built. And I'm going to combat theological swords with some people, but while everybody else is looking for a third physical temple to be rebuilt and a return back to animal sacrifices, oh my, and a Levitical priesthood, while everybody's looking for that, God has already built His third temple. I said, God has already built His third temple. So when I began to look at this, I began to realize that the new covenant He was wanting to pour into Israel, they were not ready to receive. And so they crucified Him because they weren't ready to receive it. And so what does He do? He has to get new people. The church, Jew and Gentile in one body. He took a remnant of first century Jews that was true Israel, and combine them with believing Gentiles, put them into a corporate body together, we call the church, which means the ecclesia, the called out ones, but really it's the new Israel. It's the new Israel. And so what happens is, he had to get a new wineskin because the old wineskin could not accept the new wine. So he had to raise up a brand new people, a remnant of Jews mixed with Gentiles so he could pour out his spirit of new wine into new wine skins. He had to raise up a church that was Jew and Gentile in one body and pour the new wine of the Holy Ghost into that new wine skin. That's what he did. So Jesus took the old temple worship system and the old priesthood and He destroyed it in 70 A.D. when He used the Romans to completely destroy old Jerusalem. Now you have to understand, the reason why He did it was because the new wine that Jesus wanted to give could not fit into that old Levitical wineskin. So He had to raise up a new breed of Israelites. He had to raise up a new breed of Israelites, a new wineskin, because here's why. Number one, sons and daughters were now going to begin to prophesy that was new wine Israel was not ready to receive. (laughs) Number two, your handmaidens will prophesy as well. That was wine that old Israel was not ready to receive. Number three, your old men will see visions and your young men will dream dreams. That was new wine that old religious Israel was not ready to receive. Speaking in tongues, that was a new wine that 
Israel was not ready to receive. So God had to hew out a new wineskin. So God will give them new wine, and God gives this church a new wine. And people begin to prophesy, speak in tongues. Handmaidens begin to prophesy. Young men and old men dream dreams and, and have visions. And this was a new thing. It was a new thing. It was a new thing a new wine but Israel would not receive it and they crucified their own Messiah and so he told to them because you will not bend I must break you and I think it was Jesus that said whomsoever shall fall upon this stone <laughs> will be broken but whomsoever this stone falls upon will grind him to powder. That was old Israel. Well, I'm not so sure, Pastor. Bring up Matthew. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And verse 33. Matthew 21, verse 33. Here, another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. The householder is God. The vineyard was Jerusalem. And the Scripture says, He hedged it round about. He digged a wine press in it. He built a tower and led it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of fruit drew near, that's tabernacles, by the way, uh, always in the fall, he sent his servants to the husbandmen. The husbandmen were the Jews, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants, his servants are the prophets, and beat one and killed another, and stoned another. How many of you know that old Israel killed their prophets that God sent to them? Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, the, 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 the vineyard, the, the householder was God, the vineyard was Jerusalem, and, and he lent it out to the Jews, and unfortunately he would send his servants to them, and, and they would kill his prophets one after another. And then the scripture goes on to say, in verse 35, and the husbandman took his servants, that's the Jews, took his prophets, and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. Look, but last of all, he sent unto them his son, that's Jesus, saying, they will surely reverence my son. But when the husbandman saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. That means they took Jesus outside the city of Jerusalem and crucified him on Golgotha Hill. Verse 40, When the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Now look at this. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh. Cometh. Some people say, oh, this one here, this. Now I believe without a doubt there's a future coming of the Lord. But when we look at this scripture, we think, is this talking about the second coming in the future? Well, let's find out. Verse 41. They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. What does that mean? That means 40 years after Jesus resurrected, he would send Roman armies to destroy the Jews and Jerusalem and turn the vineyard into the hands of Gentiles that would bring forth fruit in the church. That's what it's saying. These are the words of Jesus. He will miserably destroy those wicked men. Who? The ones who killed his son. 
and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Oh, I don't know, Pastor. I don't know. We'll look at verse 42. Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the Scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. And given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard this parable, they perceived that he spake of them. They knew who he was talking about. That in A.D. 70, Jesus would come in judgment against that old Levitical temple worship system. A Levitical priesthood that was only temporary. A physical temple that was only temporary. A physical circumcision that was only temporary. A physical people that was only temporary. And forever replace it with a spiritual temple. A spiritual people, a spiritual circumcision, and a spiritual priesthood. I don't know about you, but I want to be the ones that bring Him fruit. So the first century Jew, and I'm not speaking about Jews of all history, I'm talking about the Jews up until the time of Christ crucified their Messiah, and because of this, He came in judgment against them 40 years later in Jerusalem in A.D. 70. That's why He said in Matthew 24, This generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Now, some people look at this and they think, Well, I'm not so sure. We'll look at verse 46. But when they sought to lay hands on Him, they feared the multitude because they took Him for a prophet. Go to chapter 22, the very next verse. Chapter 22, Matthew 22, verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants. There's the old prophets again. The Old Testament. The remnant, that's the Jews, took the prophets, entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king thereof, when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, angry. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. When did this happen? 70 A.D. He burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, Now the wedding's ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out. Now, this is after A.D. 70. So the servants went out. This is the church age. Into the highways, gathered together all as many as they found, both good and bad, and the wedding was furnished with the guests. Now, this is the second coming. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither? not having a wedding garment, and he was speechless. So you understand then that because Israel would not receive the new wine of the new covenant, God had 
to destroy the old wineskin. And he had to build up a church comprised of both Jew and Gentile, a new wineskin, and pour the new wine into them that old Israel would not accept. Hallelujah. Now the same is true for this hour. So many people are speculating what's going to happen. You know this Monday there is going to be a historical, a historical sign in the heavens. There is going to be a eclipse that will, I, I believe it has been nearly a century since this kind of eclipse has happened. And sometime this Monday around 1 or 2 p.m., just about it from our point of view, 80 to 90 percent of the sun will be darkened. What does this mean? Well, skip forward exactly 32 days later, and we're going to have the sign of Revelation 12 in the heavens that we've been talking about this year. What is these signs pointing to? Am I saying that Jesus is coming again on September 23rd? Not hardly. But what I am saying is, is that there is a season of change. A season of new. As we transition out of the age of Pentecost into the age of tabernacles. The question needs to be asked, are we ready for a tabernacle's wine? Because are we comfortable with a Pentecostal wine and old Pentecostal wineskins? I'm going to tell you, there is nothing more stubborn, more brittle, and more hard than a Pentecostal wineskin. But God wants to stretch us because He wants to give us a tabernacle's anointing. But until we get a tabernacle's mentality, we will never be able to house a tabernacle wine. Until we get a tabernacle's mentality and understanding and until we let go of the Pentecost old wineskin that has become old and outdated. Why? God is doing a new thing. Former things have passed away and He's ushering us into a new age. A new age. The kingdom of God is coming. And God is preparing us and stretching us and bending us even if it means some of us break. Because I'm going to tell you, God will not pour wine, new wine, into old wineskins and the old wineskins break and the new wine be lost. I hate to burst your bubble. There's one thing that God loves more than the wineskin, and that's the wine. And if the wineskin won't conform, He'll find new wineskins to put new wine in. And while the majority of the church world is saying, let's look back to the former things, how we used to do it, how it was done before, God is saying, look not to the former things of old. I'm doing a new thing. You're walking in uncharted territory. This is a tabernacle's age with a tabernacle's anointing, but it's got to take a tabernacle's mind and mentality and a tabernacle's church to receive a tabernacle's wine. My goodness. Mm. God wants to give this church a new wine. A new move of the Spirit. A new level in God. A new dimension in power. A new dimension in God. But until we are willing to change, unless the wineskin is willing to stretch and bend, then we're going to keep drinking stale old wine. God wants to give us new fresh wine, a new fresh move of the Spirit. But you know what the biggest hindrance to a new wine is, a new move of the Spirit? The old wine skin that the last wine was in. I've said it many times, I'll say it again. The biggest hindrance to the current move of God is always the last one. 
God wants to give new fresh wine of the Spirit, but it's sometimes the structure that the wine goes in. It's the structure and how we do things and how we've become old and outdated and the people of that old wineskin, the people of that old wineskin telling them you've got to bend, you've got to stretch is the last thing that wineskin wants to hear. But if they're going to be the ones to receive the new wine, then they're going to have to be willing to stretch their wine skin, stretch their mind. Uh, an old wine skin is stubborn and will not stretch. It will not bend. It refuses to expand. In fact, in its religious mindset, it takes pride in the fact that it won't bend or expand. Do you understand that the hardest systems to change are religious systems. Why are they the hardest to change? Because the old wineskins becomes old and outdated. And God wants to bring a new level of the prophetic into the church. And I think that the very purpose of my ministry and my prophetic ministry, that many people will say, now, when God uses Brother Reed and when God speaks through Brother Reed and he prophesies to people, yeah, that's usually accurate, but, but don't think that what he's teaching is right. See, they want the wine, but they want to contain it in an old wineskin. They want the new level of gifting, the new level of power, but they want to put it in an old container. It's the old Pentecostal wineskin that says, why can't we have revival? Why can't we have a move of God? Because God says, I won't put it in that old wineskin. My goodness. God wants to bring a new level of the prophetic into the church. He wants to bring new mantles into the church. New ministries into the church. New gifts into the church fresh revelation into the church, but it don't fit in their wineskin. It doesn't fit in the old box they've tried to keep God fixated in. Sometimes even the ministry changes the way we do things and how we teach on some things. But the problem is, the old wineskin wants a move of the Spirit, and they want more of God, but God won't give new wine to old wineskins because it'll burst and they'll both be lost. And I said it before and I'll say it again, God is wanting to protect the wine more than the wineskins. The old wineskin is the structures and the paradigms of old churchianity. And you know that's the reason why a lot of times denominations and organizations will lose powerful ministries among them that are gifted men of God because those gifted men of God represent a new wine in an old system that said its ways will not accept it. Because the new wine brings change in how they see things, how they do things, and how they've always done things. And when the old wine skin refuses to stretch and to expand and grow, God says, I refuse to give them the new wine. And so their churches become twice dead, plucked up by the roots, and will not grow. Why is it Pentecostalism expanded and flourished in the 50s and 60s and 70s? But now we've been hovering worldwide. Oneness Pentecostalism has been hovering between 4 to 6 million the last 30 years. Did you know that? UPC has been hovering 4 to 6 million the last 30 years. I'm not talking about an outpouring of the Spirit. 
I'm talking about the church that says they have the truth. God is pouring out His Spirit to the Baptist people. And the Methodist people are getting the Holy Ghost. And Catholics are getting the Holy Ghost. Why? Because God wants to do something bigger than the Pentecostals allow Him. Because God's wine don't fit the wineskin of God's people. So what happens is, God doesn't give them new wine. The churches become stale and don't grow and don't have revival. And, and it's why ministries, big powerful ministries, will either leave them or they will kick those ministries out. Because what God is doing is bigger than their current wineskin. And they are unwilling to expand. So you know what God has always done to His people? He will send a man of God to challenge you, to challenge old mentalities and challenge old paradigms. And sometimes it gets very uncomfortable. When people try to fight for ground and people try to fight and sometimes they look at the wineskin stretching and you know what they call it? Compromise. But we're not talking about compromise we're talking about expansion, increase, and stretching, which is what is required to get the new wine. It's not that God doesn't want to give us the new wine. He is the God of new things. Read Isaiah. God does want to do a new thing, but the problem is sometimes us. We are... Not ready, stuck in our old wineskins. So what every one of us needs to do tonight is take a look at our personal wineskins. And you're going to have to believe God that tonight you are going to become expandable. Do you understand religion will make you rigid? It will hinder you from getting the new wine. I said religion will hinder you from getting the new wine. Because we all religion sees the expansion of wine as compromise. I said all religion sees the expansion that the wine brings as compromise. I refuse to be stuck in yesterday's wineskins. What worked yesterday does not work today. I'm not talking about the gospel. The gospel never changes. I'm talking about how we do things, our paradigm, our outlook, our, the way we look at people, the way we look at situations. I want God to be able to shake me and let that new wine expand in me. And when the new wine is poured out, I'm going to expand with it. And sometimes God expands the wineskin through the preaching, through ministry. And it's the, the way we change, the way we do things. It's to change how we think, how we see things. Even change the way we do things in our services. It even changes how we define things. And, and, and it may even be different than the generation before and how they defined it. Because you're only going to receive a new wine. If you're truly ready to stretch. Some of you are telling God, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm uncomfortable with this. I want to stay like I am. Like I've always thought. Some of us are saying, I want to do church the way we've always done it. Just find a way, preacher, just to make it more exciting. Really, the truth of the matter is, many of us are saying, find a way to get a new power in the old system. You understand that's what a lot of people are saying in the church now. Don't challenge our traditions and our old ways of doing things. Give us new wine in the old wineskin. And God says, no, I'm going to hold it until you're willing to expand with what I'm ready to give you. You know, sometimes God even gives a church a new name. When I changed the church's name to the ark, 
I knew a new name would give us a new identity. You understand that when God changed Abraham's name, it set the course of his destiny. When God changed Jacob's name to Israel, it set the course of his destiny. A new name gave him a new identity. And so tonight we need to ask God to show us anything that is blocking the flow of wine. Not anything that contradicts the word, but to honestly reevaluate and take a fresh look at the word to see if the word is really saying what the old wineskin was saying it was saying all along. Some people say, well, I accept it and I see it and I know it's right. I just can't see it. I can't embrace it. You understand that that is something that you are going to have to struggle with in your mind until you get victory over that. Can I give you a secret? A big secret? Do you know many people's relationship with God? Not, not all. But many people's relationship with God is often a lot like their relationship with their father. They see their natural father. They see their heavenly father. Now, I'm not saying this is in every case. I'm just saying many people look at their heavenly father through the experience they've had with their earthly father. When people have issues with living for God, many times it's because they've got daddy issues. What do you mean, pastor? If your earthly daddy criticized everything you do as a kid, then you're going to think God looks at you the same way. Boy, it's quiet in here. That's okay. And I believe a father needs to be an authoritative disciplinary figure. But if your dad was overbearingly strict on you, then guess how you'll look at God? You won't accept him for nothing less than just being a harsh old disciplinary. If you was abused by your earthly father, it'll affect your, your perspective of your heavenly father. If your earthly father did not provide for you, you'll struggle to believe that God will provide your needs. A child's father helps a child develop a self-image. If, if your father beat you down, criticized you, belittled you, demeaned you, then unfortunately, many people will look at God through the lenses of how their relationship was with their earthly father. And so when God tries to get them to see him different, or to see them see God as a loving Father who will supply all their needs. Let me explain to you. If somebody, let me give you an example. If somebody struggles with that and they had a father that was very strict and very critical of them and, 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 and was rigid towards them, then that person will grow up as a saint of God. And here's what they'll do. They'll be afraid they'll go to hell for every little move they make. But can't yet believe God will even hear their prayers. I'm getting in some deep stuff right now. There are a lot of people I have counseled over the years who struggle with a mentality, a strong religious upbringing. And many things were good with that. But they think God would send them to hell if they accidentally show their elbows or the top of their flabby arm. But yet they won't even think that God will hear or answer their prayer. Why would you want to serve a God that would send you to hell for something so rigid and small like that, but you can't even have enough faith in that God to hear your prayers. 
I'm going to help you, some of you tonight, why you struggle in your relationship with God because you see your heavenly Father many times, not all of us, I get it, not all, but many of us see our heavenly Father through the lenses of our earthly Father. So if your earthly daddy was never there, you'll always question God why he doesn't seem to be either. If your earthly father abandoned you as a child, then every little bad thing that happens, you'll think that God is abandoning you as well. He's not abandoning you. You're just going through a trial. You're just going through a test. It's not the end. It's just a fact. You have learned to view God through the lenses of how you view your earthly father. I think it was Jesus that said these words. If your earthly father knows how to good gifts, give good gifts unto his children, how much more? How much more will your heavenly Father know how to give good gifts unto them which call on His name? And I want to help some of you tonight because the truth of the matter is you view God through the lenses of your earthly father's mistakes. And that's why you struggle with spiritual confidence. You, know, you want to know the reason why you doubt that God will listen to you when you pray? Because you never could get your dad's attention either. Man, it's quiet. <laughs> some of you saints, you better stick with me right now because I'm meddling some tough stuff, but it's true. Because I'm exposing why some of you struggle living for God. If your daddy was physically, emotionally, or sexually abusive to you, then you'll think every trial you go through or difficulty in life is God beating up on you. And you'll blame God. Instead of blaming the devil. <laughs> Is anybody hearing what I'm saying right now? I know you're just listening. See, sometimes the truth is hard to receive. But it's true. That ought to call some of you dads to step up to the plate and be the best kind of dad you can be to your kids. Because remember, one day they're going to grow up struggling living for God because of the lack that you did as a dad. So you need to ask God to give you grace to be the best kind of dad in His image that you can be. Because it may not affect you, but it will affect the child that you're raising. I just don't feel like God loves me. Well, you felt the same way about your earthly father. I just don't understand why God doesn't seem to be there for me. Well, you felt the same thing about your earthly father. I just don't understand why God's not there for me when I need him the most. Well, you felt the same way about your earthly father. And I'm trying to tell you, I'm not belittling your dad. He was just a man. My dad made mistakes, and this dad makes mistakes too. But here's what I'm telling you. You, are, you can only begin to grow and stretch the wineskin and get ready to receive new wine until you start seeing God for what He is. God just doesn't have love. He is love! And He's not, one, he's not just some... He's not just some disciplinary with some club up there waiting for you to just make some mistake. And The truth of the matter is, as long as you're trying to do right, as long as you're trying and your face is set towards Him and you're trying to live for Him and you're trying to do your best, 
wherever you fall short, he's going to stand in the gap and say, I love you and I accept you anyways. I'm not going to beat you. I'm not going to abuse you. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to walk away from you. I'm going to be good to you. You can trust me. You can have faith in me because he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. What was your dad strict on you about? You'll think God is strict on you the same way even if His Word says He's not. Some of you are hard on yourselves in too many areas and you let people beat you up emotionally and wear you out. And one day, one of these days, you're going to raise up and it might as well be today to stand up and say, I don't care what people say, what people think because there's one that I'm trying to please above all else anyways. And maybe, maybe, maybe when I become who God made me to be, instead of trying to be what my parents or my grandparents are trying to make me to be, oh, let God make you in His image. Not in theirs. I'm walking and I'm ministering to many of you right now and there's tears coming down your face because I'm speaking to you in the Holy Ghost right now. You know why some people believe that when people mess up in church, that, that you know, you, they, religious people just throw them under the bus and forget them and move on and replace them and give up on them and say, well, we knew they wouldn't make it anyway? Because that's how they were treated in their childhood as well. It was one and done. If you grew up in a home where you were not the preferred child, Maybe you were the middle child. And you can be the middle child and still be loved. I'm just saying, you know what I'm talking about. Some people grow up in homes and the parent chooses a, a favored child. You know, there's a lot of people that struggle with that. And so when you grow up and then you get in the church and you become a part of another family, you feel inferior as well. And so when somebody else gets blessed or gets a new car or a new home or gets a promotion or gets used in the church, you feel insufficient in yourself. You don't feel good enough in yourself. You have an inferiority complex. Instead of, so, instead of rising up and saying, God loves me for who I am. You see, God doesn't look at your mistakes and say, that's why I reject you. God looks at what you can be and says, that's why I'm reaching for you right now. So as long as you're striving, as long as you're trying to live for Him, you don't have to feel second rate, second best. And then some people on the opposite end of the stick grow up in an only child home or they're the favorite child in the home and they think everything and everybody in the church should cater to that. Well, I'll not go down that path. <laughs> Blessed is he who is not offended in my words, Jesus said. I've said some pretty tough and strong stuff tonight. But if you are ready and you can receive what I'm saying, then you're showing God you're ready for the new wine. But if what I've gave to you tonight is too much of a strong drink, then you've just showed God and everybody else why you're not ready to go to the next level. Mercy sakes. Let's all raise our hands all across this place. Oh, God. Oh, God. Can I tell you, it was people that was abused by a father growing up that's always going to be looking 
for spiritual abuse in the church. When you correct them, you're abusing them. You're being mean to them. Because they've developed a sensitivity towards God and the kingdom of God through the lenses of what happened to them as a child. Don't be, don't be offended by my words tonight. Take a look at what I've said and say, my goodness, there's some truth in that somewhere. And I find myself somewhere in what he's described tonight. And it causes me to want to take my wife Don't make him have to break you for you to receive what he has for you. Let's stand all over this place right now. I want to make it clear that if you had a bad father, I'm not saying that you're not going to be successful living for God. I'm just pointing out to you the pitfalls that you have this to overcome, but you can overcome it. You know what? Young men, before you ever marry a woman, There's got to be some strong conversations. Young men, find out what relationship your girlfriend had with her dad. Chances are, if she was molested by her father, she'll cheat on you. I'm being real, folks. Let's put all the pretenses down. That don't mean she will. But there's a propensity there that she'll have to overcome. And, and young ladies, if you're looking for a husband, see what kind of relationship your boyfriend has with his mother. Because if his mom before you was the most important woman in his wife, and now you're about to become the, the, the new most important woman in his wife, I think you ought to check to see how he treated the more, most important woman until you came along. And that'll determine a little bit how he treats you. Oh, man, it's quiet in here tonight. Now, I'm not saying if your dad wasn't there, I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about people who had that. Because I'll be honest with you, people who had a good father and a good relationship with their father oftentimes excel at living for God. It's true because they had an earthly father to give them a good perception of what they felt towards God. If you have good feelings towards your dad, you get it. You're going to have good feelings. I'm not saying it has to be that way. I'm just saying... This is why relationships are important. Somebody wants new wine in your life. Somebody's going to leave here tonight and say, well, Brother Reed said this, and that's not describing me. I didn't say it's a cookie cutter situation. I said there are exceptions to every rule. I get that. But no matter what disadvantage you may have against you, you understand a disadvantage is not a disability. And whatever disadvantage you've had in life or towards your father does not have to determine your relationship with God. From this moment forward, you can recognize what's held you back or limited you to this point. And from this day forward, you're going to view God through a different lens. Hallelujah. Anointing fall. On me, oh, anointing, fall on me.
ourselves a place to pray tonight and talk to the Lord and say, God, I want to have a new perception of my Heavenly Father. And I want Him to fill me with that new wine. Change me, Lord, so that I'm ready to receive from You what You have for me in this season. Let's lift our voices to Him and begin to pray from the front to the back. From the front to the back. From the front to the back. Tell Him, say, God, change me and change my perception of you. Pebbly preached evangelistic last week and he got you all fired up and then pastor has to step back up and be a pastor. <laughs> Both ministries are needed in the church. We need to be pumped up and then we also need to have our worldview corrected. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Sing it with me. Anointing fall on me. Anointing fall on me. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me. Anointing fall on me. find somebody to pray with. There's folks that are touched right now. There's folks that need somebody to comfort them and help them. There's folks that are wrestling in their mind. They're going to get the victory. They're going to be victorious. They're going to win that battle. They're going to win that battle. Yes, Lord. 
Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me. Don't judge the message. Let the message judge you tonight. Let the message penetrate your heart. Let God affect you permanently. Never let your earthly father's insufficiencies compare to the greatness of our God. You can become better. We can become better. Prepare our hearts, Lord, to be a sanctuary. Prepare these wineskins for the new wine. New wine for new wineskins. New wine for new wineskins. Let us not make the mistake that Israel made when Jesus brought new wine. They weren't ready for it. And you recognize the Pentecost age began. And the Passover age before Him crucified the new Pentecost age that was beginning. Passover was started by Moses. And it went all the way from the giving of the law till Jesus came. Jesus came to begin Pentecost. You recognize that? The problem is, is that it was the people that were saved under the Passover age crucified the one who was going to bring Pentecost. Jesus was the one who was the giver of the Holy Ghost. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost in fire. But it was the people, the Israelites, the Jews, that received the law at Passover that began in the Passover age, crucified the one that was trying to bring them into the new age of Pentecost. Well, guess what? We're about to enter into the coming kingdom, the age of tabernacles. And each age change required change from the wineskin. And it required a bending and a shaping and a rethinking of the people of God of that age. The Pentecost age could no longer think like the old covenant Passover Jews. 
And the tabernacle sons and daughters can no longer think like the Pentecostal servants did. I'm not going to re-preach the message. I love you all. I'll see you all Sunday morning. Shake hands and be friendly. We love every one of you. Continue to pray.